So welcome everybody to the Mora Coast Audubon Society community meeting for September. And uh, this is our fifth, I believe, program that we've done on Zoom. And we've been finding it wonderful because you can also go back and re-access any of these talks on the YouTube channel, thanks to uh, Dave setting up a YouTube channel for us. Um, I have a couple of announcements. The first is going to be political. It has to do with uh, California AB Bill 1788, which is to put a moratorium on the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides that have been wrecking such carnage on the predators in, well, all over the country, but in California, this is particularly targeted for California. It's a California bill. Um, it passed out of both the Senate and the Assembly in California, and it is presently sitting on Governor Newsom's desk where he is deciding whether or not to sign it. So I would encourage everyone to write, it can be very short, but urge the governor to sign AB 1788, which is the moratorium on anticoagulants. Um, Next announcement is I would urge everyone to become a member of Morocos Audubon Society if you are not, because it helps us with managing our Sweet Springs Preserve and other places. We're in the midst of trying to put up an osprey nest, so it will help support activities like that. And it also at supports our uh, conservation activities having to do with Osa Flaco Lake and things like AB 1788. If you wish to, to become a member, go to moracoastaudubon.org and there's a little yellow donate button in the upper right hand corner or one of the tabs says support us. You can drop down and make your donation that way. I want to announce next month's program. It will be Monday, October 19th and Dave Keeling is back with his program on the birds of San Luis Obispo County. If you have ever come to these meetings, they are fantastic. Dave puts out a call to all of the hotshot photographers in San Luis County for birds that they have photographed that six month period in San Luis Obispo County. And we have some absolutely outstanding photographers. Dave does a great job of integrating all their photographs. He puts has a couple of people that come and do live music for it, and they will also be on the Zoom program. So join us next month, Monday, October 19th. It should be great. Uh, two sort of housekeeping things. If you have a question, we're going to have you type the question into chat and Dave will ask those questions at the end of Jessica. So that's the way you can get your questions in. I'm also going to ask everybody to turn their video off. Um, there's always a little strip of, of people on the side. And if you don't have your video off and you're yawning and ooching around, it's, it's kind of distracting. So if you would do the, us that favor, that would be great. And I would now like to introduce our program presenter for the day, which is Jessica Griffiths. Now, some of you may know Jessica. She's done a lot of programs and field trips for us. But for those of you who don't know about her, she's been working as a wildlife biologist for nearly 20 years. She currently works as a biologist for Altasa Mead Incorporated in Paso Robles. But prior to moving to the San Luis Obispo area, she worked in Big Sur for the Ventana Wildlife Society, overseeing all of their songbird research projects and also running the Big Sur Ornithology Lab for several years. She is very actively involved with Mora Coast Audubon and leads year-round bird walks when we do bird walks, <laughs> again, for birders of all ages, from children to seniors. Um, and her topic tonight is going to be flocking behavior. And you have may have wondered, you know, what makes some species flock? Why do other species not flock? Is it always a flock of, of the same species or are there multi-species flocks? So those are all the kinds of questions that Jessica will be addressing tonight. So Jessica, warm welcome. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Judy, for that very lovely introduction. Um, I'm excited to give a presentation to you guys in this new virtual world. Um, so hopefully everything will go smoothly. 
Uh, as Judy mentioned, my presentation today is about uh, flocking and I chose that because it is fall and this is a time of year when many birds do flock for, for lots of different reasons. And so without further ado, let me make sure, let's get this presentation going. Okay, there we go. So um, I titled my presentation, Why Birds Flock, although I will say that an alternate title was What the Flock, but I decided to go with this instead. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So flocks are a really unique phenomenon of nature and um, they can be really huge and dazzling like this flock of starlings or they can be loud and kind of annoying like a giant flock of crows, or they can be beautiful and mysterious like a flock of geese flying in front of the moon. And for a really long time, flocking birds have captured our imagination, but we might actually wonder why do birds actually do it and what is the science behind flocking? So I, um, I'm gonna hopefully answer questions. But let's talk first with uh, about the basics. So why flock? Um, and really it's all about benefits and costs. Um, those of you that have seen my migration presentation know that this is also part of why birds migrate, but there are lots of benefits to flocking. Uh, there's part of foraging. So that means foraging together to be more successful in finding food items. They can share information about where food resources are, and they can also share information about where and when predators might occur. Uh, there's also just safety in numbers. So the more birds are around, the less likely each individual is to fall prey to a predator. And it can also help them in finding a mate. So when all of your, all the birds are gathered together in one spot, it can be much easier to locate a potential mating partner. Of course, there are, if there are a lot of birds around, there's also increased competition for food. There's also potentially higher risk of disease. If many individuals are crowded together, that can um, assist pathogens in spreading. Um, there's also potentially increased aggression uh, between birds as they get closer and closer. So really, um, it all comes down to accounting. So do the costs outweigh the benefits? And so tonight I'm gonna cover sort of the main reasons that birds flock together. And so these three areas are migration, foraging, and safety. So first let's talk about migration. So really when most people think of flocks, I think they really think of that sort of typical V-shaped flock of migrating birds. Um, so let's kind of talk about how and why that might actually happen. Um, Large birds tend to need extra lift, they're heavy. Uh, these are the birds that tend to migrate together in a flock. These are birds like waterfowl, so geese, ducks, cranes, swans, you know, think of those large body birds. And it's really all about energetics. So this V-shaped formation actually generates lift for the birds who are flying. The birds who are riding the wake of the bird in front they do less work. In fact, the bird in front is doing most of the work. Um, and in fact, the birds flying in the wake of the leader are actually saving up to 40% of their energy. So that bird in front doing lots of work, the others are kind of reaping the benefits, but in fact, they do switch positions. So that leader will be flying for a while until it gets tired and then it will drop back and another bird will take its place. It's really the same principle as cyclists riding the draft of the, of the biker in front of them. So, um, these large-bodied birds are grouped together. Uh, so there's a really great study, or researchers actually conducted this study examining exactly how these large flocking birds are deriving benefits from the formation of flight. And so the study was published in 2014 and they were studying northern bald ibises. And here we have a couple pictures of these guys. And really it's honestly a mother could love. They're not the most attractive, but you know what? It, that's, that's just <laughs> how they are. 
Okay, so here we have a picture of the uh, researchers film the, the northern bald ibis, the juvenile with the special backpacks. You can see um, the bird is definitely large enough to carry it. And so I actually got a video, uh, the researchers put this video uh, online that shows um, the birds flying in formation. So this video was taken by the researcher who's in the light plane and hopefully this will work. So there we go. So all the, this is the birds being trained to follow that light plane in flight. So you can see um, they all fly in, in, in a line here and uh, they've got their backpacks attached to them. Okay, so the results of the study actually show where each bird is in space. So this looks a little bit confusing, but basically each of these figures is the position of every single bird. And you can see that the shape of the flock in flight is sort of a crescent or boomerang shape. And the gray is the position of all the birds in the flock. And then each blue area is where the birds spent time. You can see that the, for instance, the bird in the very center spent most of its time in the middle of the flock. Um, whereas the bird in the very lower left spent most of its time on the left side of the flock. So that kind of shows that each bird had, had sort of a spot that they liked to hang out. But you can also see how much they move around within the flocks. So that shows you how the birds are really constantly changing position as they go. And what they found is that the birds will actually change how they beat their wings according to their position. So when the birds are flying in a staggered position, as we see in the upper left, that's little figure A there, they will actually um, synchronize their wing beats with the burn of them. And that maximizes the beneficial upwash or updraft capture. Um, and when they are flying um, directly behind the bird, as we see in little figure D there in the upper right, they will unsync and alternate wing beats with the bird in front of them and that avoids the detrimental downwash. So the birds are actually changing how they're flapping depending on where they are in the flock in order to maximize their energy benefits. So just a really fascinating paper that shows how much the birds are actually doing in order to get the most out of their journey and how the energetic benefits actually are. So the next time you see birds flying in a V formation, you'll know how much work they're actually doing to save energy. So let's switch gears and talk about flocks and foraging. One of the absolute most important reasons for birds to join a flock is to improve their foraging success. And it's been shown that birds foraging efficiency increases when they're in a flock. So that means they can find food faster in less time. And the, part of the reason that works is that birds will actually watch their flock mates and they can learn the location of hidden food items or how best to forage. So for instance, if one bird figures out that there's a certain kind of bug or insect that likes to hide in the bark crevices and is having success, the other birds will see that and they'll start doing it too and they'll start finding those bugs and so they'll have increased foraging success. The birds also can spend less time watching for predators because there's many eyes, they're all looking out, so each individual doesn't have to spend as much time on vigilance and spend more time foraging. So that's very beneficial for them as well. And birds can also snatch up that is flushed and missed by one bird. So a great example of this is ground hornbills in Africa. Um, they will forage along the ground and the birds in front will flush up some of the prey and they'll be eating, but anything that they miss the birds behind can pick up. So those birds are all benefiting from being in a flock together. Another really great example of cooperative foraging is something that I know a lot of us have seen actually at Oso Flocko, uh, which is pelicans. So this is a really uh, classic example of birds foraging in a group to maximize their benefits. So they all will form a ring, open up their bills and basically scoop towards the center corralling the fish and other invertebrates, and then they can all scoop them up and eat them. So multiple birds foraging together 
um, do a much better job of catching fish than just one bird on its own. And I love this picture because you see that cormorant hanging out in the center has really figured out that is the spot to be. It's just hanging out, waiting for the fish to come straight to it. Okay, so up until now, we've actually just been talking about flocks composed of only one species. I think everybody is really familiar with that phrase, birds of a feather flock together. And that's rooted in the observation that large flocks of birds are very often comprised of just a single species. But in fact, birds of different species can and do form flocks. And these are often referred to as mixed species foraging flocks. So these are flocks comprised of more than one species. Uh, these are birds that are foraging together in order to maximize their benefits. And they're often led by what's actually called a nuclear species. Um, these are birds that actually will attract other birds and they lead the flock. And I know the first thing we think of when, at least when I learned the term nuclear species was some sort of crazy nuclear experiment gone horribly wrong. And in fact, when you Google nuclear bird, this is what comes up. <laughs> the internet is kind of a weird place, but this is not what I'm talking about. In fact, what I mean is nuclear in the sense of the nucleus. Think of a nucleus at the center of an atom or the nuclear family. So nuclear species have very specific characteristics. They're often gregarious. They're very social and they will form flocks. They display conspicuous plumage coloration. They're usually year-round residents, so these are not migrants that leave the area, and they have very well-developed alarm calls, and very often they have alarm calls that are very specific to a lot of different predators. So in our part of the country, here in San Luis Obispo, our primary nuclear species is the chestnut-backed chickadee, and they've got all the characteristics of a nuclear species. They're a permanent year-round resident. Um, after the breeding season over, they form very social flocks that are really cohesive. They have very bold facial markings. The black and white is really easy to recognize. And they have loud recognizable calls and they have a variety of very distinct alarm calls. So here in Central California, this is our primary nuclear species. And as migrating birds are flocking through the area, um, they're often unfamiliar with the habitat that they're sitting over in. And so, you know, how do you find food in an unfamiliar place? If you go to a new town, you're traveling in a new place, you know, nowadays, of course, the answer is, well, you look on your phone or you consult Yelp, but think about before cell phones, um, you would ask a local. That's the best place to get information. And so actually these migrating birds are really doing the same thing. So they are finding these year round resident species who know the area and they are joining the flocks and it's very beneficial for migrating birds to join flocks led by residents because those are the birds that know they know where all the food is, they know where the water is, and they know what kinds of predators are in the area and they can give alarm calls that will allow those birds to recognize those predators. So it's really beneficial for them. And um, here in our area, these are some of the migrating species that we see joining these mixed species foraging flocks. Um, in fact, actually dozens of migrants have been documented participating in mixed species foraging flocks in Central California. And I know that a lot of you birders out there know that particularly in the fall, one of the best ways to find an unusual or vagrant migrant is to find a chickadee flock, find a flock and scour that flock because you never know what might be taking part in that flock. So here I've got pictures of some of our common migrants, Wilson's warblers, yellow warbler, Pacific flycatcher, downy woodpeckers are actually residents, but they will often join these flocks. Warbling vireos, Townsend's warblers, but all kinds of birds will, will join these flocks. It really is um, a great place to find some interesting birds. Okay, what about mixed species foraging flocks in other parts of the world? Well, in fact, in the tropics, multi-species flocks are so important that birds which flock together, these different species, have actually evolved matching colors. And it's really fascinating. So in Central and South America, depending on what region you're in, flocking birds will actually have these coordinated colors. And there's a couple possible functions. Um, one is that those colors could act as sort of a badge 
that increases acceptance by flock members. So if you're sporting those colors and you come to join that flock, you're less likely to be chased away by the birds that are in that flock. It could also act as sort of a uniform that actually aids those flock members in recognizing that you belong to that flock. So it's pretty neat and I've got a couple of examples. So in the mountains of Western Panama, the flock uniform is black and yellow. So here we have six bird species that very commonly flock together and you can see how color coordinated they are. And there's actually more, I just chose six, but there's um, you know really eight to 10 species that all have um, black and yellow colors. And these birds very commonly forage together. And it's also common is that they all tend to be um, foraging in slightly different areas. So slightly different areas of the canopy, foraging in slightly different ways. So some of them might be going after bugs on the leaves, some might be looking in the crevices. So they're not 100% overlapping. But um, it's just pretty neat to think about how these sort of uniforms have evolved. And another example, in the South Central Andes, um, the colors are blue and chestnut. Um, and so it's just pretty cool to think about how um, how important these mixed species foraging flocks are that the bird's plumage has actually um, converged really with these colors. And there's lots of other examples of this in you know, specific regions of Latin America, but I just wanted to share these two. So pretty neat. And these little guys are super colorful, just fun to see. Okay, so last but not least, I wanna talk about flocking for safety. So as we all know, there are, there's safety in numbers. And the main, one of the main reasons birds do flock together is protection. So this photo is of a peregrine falcon swooping on a flock of European starlings. This photo was actually taken in the Central Valley. And I have a lot more photos by this photographer um, because it's a really great illustration of this phenomenon. So, Flocking for safety, let's talk about why birds do that. Well, first of all, there's increased chances of spotting a predator. So the more birds you have, the more sets of eyes you have looking out for predators, and you're more likely to see the predator coming. So of course, birds equal more lookouts. Um, also, the same equation that applies for foraging together in a flock also applies here. So each bird can spend less time being vigilant. If they're all looking out some of the time, then there's no individual bird that necessarily has to look out all of the time. Um, and alarm calls given in the flock will warn all the birds in the area. So as soon as one bird in the flock sees a predator, it will alarm call and then birds in the area will be alerted to that predator. So it's really beneficial for all the birds in the area. The one component of this is what we call vigilance and vigilance basically means keeping an eye out for predators. So one um, great example of this oops, sorry, is um, ostriches. So ostriches have to keep an eye out for lions and at any given time at least one bird is playing lookout while the others forage. Um, ostriches of course are like six feet tall so they can really see those lions from a long way away and unfortunately I think I I might have given a little spoiler to the next bird, but there is a local bird here uh, in Slow County that often very conspicuously posts the lookout to the flock, and that is the California quail. So um, they will actually take turns. So they will post a sentinel bird, very often that's a male, but not always, who sits up high and they keep a lookout for predators while the rest of the flock forages and then they take turn and gets hungry, it will fly down and join the flock and another bird will take its place. So in this way, they can really maximize their protection and their foraging. And there's the rest of the flock. So if a predator is spotted and does give chase, um, being in a flock is really beneficial because there's a lower chance of any one individual getting caught. Think about peregrine chasing after a flock of thousands of starlings, the odds that any one of those birds is going to get eaten is much lower than if the bird was on its own. And so that confers a real benefit to the members of the flock. 
And birds that actually get separated from the flock are the ones that are more likely to be eaten. And so there is pressure, selection pressure, for the birds to be able to stay in the flock, fly cohesively together, um, and not get separated. So here are some more photos from that photographer, Nick Dunlap, um, taking pictures of peregrine falcons going after flocks of European starlings. And again, this is from the Central Valley. So you can see in the upper left, the peregrine swooping, the starlings have formed a tight ball. And in this picture, as the peregrine zooms into the flock, the long gates up, trying to avoid the bird. And then just another really great photo. So you can see how difficult it would be for a peregrine to pick out any single target within this flock. And then that's one of the points is that the birds are trying to present this sort of unified front, make it very difficult for the peregrine to choose any specific target. And if any of you have ever seen shorebirds or starlings or any other flock of birds evading a predator, you know that they're constantly swooping, moving, and turning in unison. And it's a really cool phenomenon to see. And it's also been a real mystery about how the heck birds actually do this. And so this was something that's actually been studied for a long time. How do flocks move in this perfect unison? And for a long time, it was a real mystery. And people have been observing this phenomenon for hundreds of years and wondering. And I have to say, some of the theories were pretty wild. Um, theories that were actually put down in writing include natural telepathy, thought transference, some sort of biological radio, or possibly a disembodied electromagnetic consciousness. So people had some pretty unusual ways of, of uh, explaining how birds might do it. They really couldn't think of any more mundane physical explanation for how they did it other than they must all be psychically linked and somehow that's all they, how they know to turn. And it turns out that that is in fact not actually true. Instead, um, it's actually something really, really fascinating. So there's a group of Italian researchers who've been working on this problem for probably about a decade. And what they did was they actually went to an area in Rome that has these giant flocks of starlings near the train station. And they filmed the flocks using three high speed cameras so that they could get an actual 3D uh, model of the flock and all the birds' movements. And then they used tracking software to analyze the movement of every bird in the flock. And you can see why this took so long to develop because they had to develop the cameras, they had to develop the software and the computers that were power powerful enough to run the analysis. But in 2014, they finally were able to kind of figure it out. And it turns out what they discovered when they did this analysis using the cameras and the software is that each individual bird is closely tracking seven birds around them. So really kind of the birds in space around them. And what they're doing is instead of copying just the direction that the neighbor goes, they're in fact copying how sharply the neighbor turns. So you don't even really have to think about which direction to fly. They're just immediately turning the same direction as all the other birds are turning. Um, and actually the researchers in the paper refer to this as spin. So if you have any kind of a background in, in physics, um, a lot of times physicists will describe particles as having a uh, spin, it's actually a characteristic. And so they figured out that the birds are actually tracking each other's spin. And the message to burn, it starts from a few birds in the flock. So the ones that are, you know, if the predator comes up on that side, those birds see the predator, they immediately turn to avoid. And the message to turn sweeps through the flock at 20 to 40 meters per second, which is about 90 miles an hour, which means that a flock of 400 birds takes only maybe half a second to turn. So, and the signal to turn does not degrade. So it's propagated almost instantaneously without degradation through the entire flock. Um, really, really cool. And the, the paper that I cite here by the researchers, um, Atanasi and et al, is just full of crazy math equations because that's how they could describe how the birds are doing this. And it turns out that the equations 
used to describe the movement of birds in a flock are actually nearly identical to describing the movement of uh, particles in liquid or supercooled heat. So the birds are actually behaving, they're actually, all, it's, it's like fluid dynamics, the way that the birds are moving. So just really fascinating. And the evolutionary pressure on them to flock this way is very strong because any birds that don't stick with the flock might get eaten. So you've just, over time, the birds have evolved this ability to just key in on each other and make those very sudden movements. Um, and that is how you can get really cool flock formations. Okay, I am gonna try something. Um, I'm going to see if I can share a video on YouTube by a, um, a Dutch photographer who filmed some really neat starlings. So I'm gonna see if I can get this to work. We're all gonna cross our fingers. Okay. So this um, video was um, shot by a photographer in the Netherlands. And these are European starlings flocking at sunset. And I've turned the sound down low enough that hopefully it won't be too loud. There's some music that accompanies it. But I just wanted to show you guys some really neat videos and think about how the birds are moving and how they can all move in unison. So here we go. So really, really cool. Um, that really brings us actually to the end. I kind of wanted to end on that neat uh, flocking note. And so um, at this point, I will take any questions that you guys have. So thank you. Okay, Jessica, one question that came up was, um, why did the Northern yes. Bald Ibis ju juveniles need to be raised by people? Were they rescues? Oh, okay, great question. So that was actually part of the research experiment. So they actually um, were raised in captivity. They were not rescue birds. They were raised in captivity. And the reason that they were raised in captivity is because they needed to train the birds to fly um, behind the plane. So they were actually, they were a wild species, but they were, the researchers got permits to raise those chicks in, cap in captivity so that they could train them to fly uh, behind the plane and so they, they could train them to fly with the backpacks. Okay. So if anybody has any other questions, please uh, type them into chat. So there's a question is, a, is about what can you tell us about shorebirds and flocking? Oh, sure. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's a great question. Shorebirds are flocking together for really all of the same reasons that uh, we talked about. So they are 
uh, foraging together in really huge numbers. Um, the main reason I think that shorebirds are flocking together is for protection. Most of them are on the small side and they can be really vulnerable. You know, they're on the beach foraging out in the open. And so by foraging together, um, they can, again, maximize their foraging efficiency while other birds are looking out for them. Uh, they use the same techniques to flock together. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen uh, when a flock of shorebird flushes and flies, uh, they also are really sticking together in an extremely tight formation, wheeling um, to avoid predators or to fly and change direction very suddenly. So they are using the exact same strategy that those starlings are where they're tracking their neighbors. Um, and mostly, um, most shorebirds are not necessarily migrating in a, migrating in a flock together. Um, some of them do, but generally they're just kind of all going the same direction and then meeting at stopover locations in these large numbers. So it's not quite the same as a flock of geese or cranes where it's the same individuals who will make the journey together. Instead, the little guys are really doing, you know, they're flying separately, but then when they're stopping over at these feeding locations, they will form the flocks during migration. Um, and how do birds in a flock not run into each other? That's a really good question, actually. <laughs> and uh, I believe that the answer is because of, first of all, their vision is really, really incredible. And birds' ability to track motion is just so much better than ours. And their ability to make decisions and to like react, their reaction time is also much faster than ours. So the, literally the second, like not even the second, but the instant that their neighbors are turning in the flock, they're seeing it and they're reacting to it. Um, and I would imagine that probably not every bird is so good at it, particularly at first. So I would imagine that there actually might be some collisions, but the birds that collide are the ones that can't stay with the flock and those are the ones that tend to get eaten. So like I said, <laughs> the, the pressure is kind of on. Okay. There is a quite a different of density of birds throughout the flock. Is there any thoughts as to why? Um, oh, when, yeah, so when we're, uh, watching those big, like the big flock flocklings and things like that. Yeah, that's a great observation. In some areas, they seem to be more clumped together. And um, what, what those researchers actually discovered is that the signal, usually the signal for when and what direction to turn comes from the birds that are clustered most tightly together. So it usually comes from the densest part of the flock. And then the more spread out areas are um, getting the message like slightly later. Um, also, the area where the predator, the threat from the predator is the greatest, the birds tend to clump more. Um, so I think too, a little bit of is, is, is random. Um, in the video that we were watching, the starlings were um, flocking together at sunset. They were not necessarily avoiding a specific predator the whole time. Um, and so you just get a little bit of, there's a little bit of randomness in how and why they clump together, but for sure, the birds that are near predator are going to be clumping the most densely. Okay. And is there a way that the, a lead bird or group of birds is chosen? Oh, I'm sorry, you broke up for one second. Can you okay. repeat the question, how, Dave? How is the lead bird chosen? Another really good question. As far as we can tell, it, there, there's no actual decision-making process. It's almost like a group decision. So the, the bird that is in front in the direction that their, the flock is flying is the leader. And in the large flocks, there's not a single leader, in fact, um, because usually what will happen is, you know, the flock is flying this direction, and you know the predators coming from that way, all of those birds like closest to the predator are, are reacting. Um, so they're, we don't really understand, I'll, I'll actually put it this way, we don't really understand how the flock reacts. Like if that one bird turns, why do all the birds follow that bird? We're not really sure about that. So it's a little bit unclear on how those leaders are chosen but it doesn't seem to necessarily be a conscious 
choice. I believe it's sort of a product of the specific stimuli, stimuli in the environment. Um, have you ever witnessed uh, coots forming a tight group on the surface of water as a flocking behavior when a predator is seen? You know what? I, I, I have not actually personally observed that, but um, I mean, I guess if you guys, has anybody actually seen that? I mean, it would make sense that they might do that. Um, I personally have never seen that. It might be that they're, they're big enough and they're capable of diving. So I wonder if that is something that might help them escape predators, but it would make sense to me that that would be something that they would do, although I've never seen it personally. And um, how does a flock visitor, like a migrant, um, recognize local local alarm calls? Oh, that's a really good question. I think, so part of it is that alarm calls by, uh, so nuclear species in, in North America, the nuclear species for mixed species foraging flocks tend to be all members of the same family. They're all parents and that's chickadees and titmice. So pretty much almost anywhere you go across the country, if you are seeing a mixed species foraging flock, the leader of that flock is very, very likely to be either a chickadee species or a titmouse species. Those birds are really closely related and their alarm calls are really similar. Um, they're loud, short, and sharp. And they're often made repeatedly and at high volume, way louder than a normal sort of regular call, like a foraging call or a contact call. And the way that um, other birds react to that, those birds are really observant. And so they can absolutely, I would imagine the first time there's alarm call, those birds will learn what that alarm call is because of the way the other birds in the flock are react. So part of it is that the alarm calls for the nuclear species are pretty similar, but also the bird can just learn it from experience. Um, are there other examples of nuclear species on the Central Coast? Um, really, it's primarily chestnut-backed chickadees here, although I would think that you could possibly get oak titmice could be, would be a candidate for a nuclear species, although they don't really form social flocks the way chickadees do. So chickadees form flocks that are not just their family, not just the two adults and the chicks. Um, they will actually form larger flocks of multiple different, you know, former breeding pairs. So lots of different adults together in the flock. And the reason we know that is through bird banding studies. Actually, you can individual color band individual birds and, and find out um, their identity. And so that type of research has shown chickadees form these large flocks. Um, chestnut back chickadees actually have a, um, for lack of a better word, like an alpha pair. There's actually a male and a female pair that are the leader of the flock. And they are kind of the dominant chickadees in the flock. And that might change from year to year. Um, and under different circumstances, but they are sort of led. And so in, in our part of California, that's, they're really the species that are leading those flocks. Oak titmouse, you might get. Um, bush tits also form really large flocks. I'm sure pretty much everybody here has seen those giant, and those are multifamily, lots and lots of adults. But the thing about bush tits is that they forage really, really rapidly. And so when they're on the move, they just really will blaze through an area. Like they forage really quickly and they will actually just leave all the other birds behind. I've actually seen this where, uh, you know, you'll get a, a flock of chickadees and warblers and vireos and then income, like you've got this incoming flock of bush tits, which joins that flock for a while, but pretty soon the bush tits are on their way. Um, they're also not as conspicuously marked um, you know, remember those chickadees have their really uh, bold markings, but, um, you know, I have not really seen in our air any other good candidates aside from the chestnut back chickadees. But if you go to um, other parts of California, so um, in the mountains, mountain chickadees are going to be your primary nuclear species. I know that back east on the east coast, 
both black-capped Carolina chickadees and also tufted titmice are very often a nuclear species with mixed species foraging flocks out there. Um, someone remarked that there's um, sometimes sees large uh, flocks of house finches and sees uh, maybe uh, one or two lark sparrows in the flock. Are house finches a yeah. nuclear species? They're not technically a nuclear species because they don't really meet the, the criteria for um, what we would consider a traditional nuclear species, which is uh, their flocks aren't as cohesive. So there's a lot of mixing. Um, house finches will kind of join this flock or that flock. Um, chickadee flocks actually have territories where that chickadee flock of those chickadees will forage in a very specific area and they will actually defend it from other chickadee flocks. You know, it's not super duper aggressive, but you know, they have a specific territory. Whereas house finches don't really do that. Um, so, but that's a great observation about the um, lark sparrows joining the finch flocks because another group of birds that forms large foraging flocks in the fall and the winter are sparrows. So think about, uh, I'm sure we've all seen flocks of white crown and golden crown sparrows. So those are birds that are forming a mixed species foraging flock. They don't necessarily have what we would consider a nuclear species leading the flock, but other birds can absolutely, you know, those are uh, ground foraging birds. And so I've seen, you know, mixed species flocks where you've got golden crown sparrow, white crown sparrow, Oregon junco, um, California toe, you know, all of our ground foragers kind of all foraging together. So it's not necessarily, there's not necessarily a nuclear species leading that, but the strategy behind the foraging flock is the same, which is safety in numbers and increased foraging efficiency. Okay, uh, I think that's it for questions. Uh, Judy, do you want to wrap up? Okay, well, Jessica, thank you so much. That was an outstanding program. I learned a lot, and I thought I knew a lot about bird flocking, but uh, you took it to a whole nother level. So thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming on this evening. So thank you to everybody who attended, and uh, we'll see you next month on the 19th of October for the Birds of San Luis County.